So our first speaker is going to be uh, Tim Cunningham. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for, oh, am I, can you see me? I'll, I'll turn my video on. Uh, yeah, so I'm Tim Cunningham from the University of Warwick. Um, and, uh, well, firstly, thanks to the organizers for organizing an interesting conference and giving me the opportunity to present some of my recent results. Uh, I'm just finishing up my PhD at the University of Warwick, and primarily I've been focused on uh, metal polluted hydrogen atmosphere white dwarfs. As we've seen in the, the previous two talks, uh, white dwarfs um, offer a unique lens by which to probe the bulk composition of evolved exoplanetary material. Um, but this is only possible if we understand very well the atmospheric structure of these um, degenerate objects. And that's where my research comes in. Um, I've been using 3D radiation hydrodynamics to study the convection zones confined to the surface of these objects. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but in the uh, bottom left uh, panel, um, yeah, this one here, thank you. Um, th this is a, a vertical slice for a snapshot of a simulation uh, in the surface of a white dwarf convection zone with effective temperature of 13,000 Kelvin. Um, now in 1D, you would model the convection zone to be confined to positive depths. So for Z values of greater than zero, uh, that's the location of the lower Schwarzschild boundary. Um, however, the, the, blue, the blue lines here correspond to convective motions. Um, and so what you should be able to see is that at negative depth values, the depth axis is arbitrary, but just calibrates to the, the Schwarzschild boundary. What you see here is that actually there's significant motion beneath uh, the, the convection zone in the form of these convective, uh, convectively stable layers. And this is due to convective overshoot. Uh, this is a, a topic which has had a lot of interest in, uh, in a various, various stellar contexts. And it's really important in uh, the modeling of evolved planetary systems around white dwarfs. Uh, that's because you increase the, the mixed mass when you include uh, convective overshoot. Um, and so I've been using uh, some numerical methods to probe how effectively convective overshoot mixes material in these layers. That's what the green stuff is. That's a passive scalar, which just traces local advective flows. Um, and what I found is that uh, in this temperature range, you can increase the mixed mass by about up to two and a half orders of magnitude. Um, when you include uh, convective overshoot. Um, so that's shown in the middle panel. So I've uh, run these simulations. Thank you. I've, yeah, I've run these simulations uh, for effective temperatures from 18,000 Kelvin, where, where convection uh, first onsets, down to 11,000 Kelvin. Um, and that directly impacts the inferred accreted masses. Um, the, 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 the mixed mass in the surface layers is one of the, the key inputs to the, uh, the modeling of, of all planetary systems. And so, yeah, the blue line is with overshoot and the red line would be from 1D models that don't allow for convective overshoots. And in the, the right panel, then I've applied these results to some real data. Uh, so I'm showing uh, accretion rates calculated for hydrogen atmosphere white dwarfs in uh, black and for helium atmosphere white dwarfs in blue. Um, and then I've applied a correction with convective overshoot, which I've denoted by a dashed green line. And what you see is that the, thank you, yeah, the, the accretion rates uh, can increase by a more modest factor of five. Um, so they don't have orders of magnitude increase. This is because the, the, the base of the mixed region is pushed to deeper layers, which are less diffusive. But nonetheless, um, I hope this highlights uh, some of the, uh, the work we've been doing to uh, characterize as precisely as possible the atmospheric structure of these objects uh, and consider the, the implications on evolved planetary systems. So there's still much more work to be done here, in particular with regards to abundance ratios. Um, but I'm happy to take questions. And I'll point you to the paper where these results are, are published, um, which I've detailed at the top there. Uh, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, maybe we could do one very quick question. 
Okay. I, I can't see my chat window anymore, so if anybody I, else could help me out. I can see one from Adam. How does the overshoot distance compare with the scale heights or the turnaround distance? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Um, the, the, where the uh, overshoot correction is um, most significant, we are going a, a couple of pressure scale heights. Um, but towards the lower end of the grid, we find that probably a, about one pressure scale height. So for, for cooler white zones, probably one pressure scale height could be considered a minimum increase that you would expect the overshoot plumes to travel over. Um, I, yeah, I can, I, I can, I can give you a more quantitative uh, answer offline if, if you'd appreciate that. All right, thank you, Tim. I think we have to move on. Okay, Rai Cutter. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. All right, hi, uh, I'm Rai. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I just wanted to talk about uh, a bit of theory work that I'm doing in uh, collaboration with a group in Leicester. Uh, and uh, in the top left there, you see a, a levitating frog, uh, and uh, the, it's being levitated through a principle of diamagnetic levitation. Uh, and what we wanted to do was apply this force uh, to tightly disruptive planetesimals uh, around magnetic white dwarfs, um, essentially marrying what Tim was just talking about and uh, Boris's talk earlier. Um, uh, and our, our sort of our key results are that um, we find that we can significantly reduce uh, disk lifetimes, um, uh, that bottom left plot there, uh, with uh, a, a general effect um, based on the tidal disruption distance, so the closer you get to the white dwarf, the stronger the effect of the magnetic field on the dust. Uh, and uh, the little x's there on that plot, uh, they're simulations as well, so our simulations are matching that analytics quite closely, which is a really nice result. Um, and then that red line there is uh, um, the predicted lifetime for unshielded PR drag. Um, and then on the right, uh, a very similar plot to what Tim just had, uh, showing the accretion rates, but instead of there being a temperature dependence, uh, we're showing the magnetic dependence instead, um, with the uh, the orange background there being the uh, um, rates predicted of all uh, white dwarfs. Um, and then the little blue X's there, they're the accretion rates of known magnetic white dwarfs. Uh, we see a slight correlation there uh, in that data, but with only seven points, it's not really a strong enough correlation to say that this is a definite um, effect. Uh, we see that for particles that are about one centimeter in size, um, we get uh, we, we our model matches quite nicely to observations. Um, uh, yeah, thanks. All right, thank you, Rai. Do we have any questions for Rai? I, again, I can't see. So, Rai, if you or somebody else wants to read out the questions. All right, well, let's well, move on. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was just saying there are no questions in the chat. Okay. Go to the next one. Thank you, Rai. All right, Katya. Yes, hi. Yeah, I quickly wanted to show uh, some recent work that we've been doing on uh, the system V1298 Tau. So this is a very young system, only 25 mega years old, and it has four known transiting planets, which were discovered relatively recently. And what we've done is we've uh, measured for the first time the X-ray spectrum of the host star using Chandra data and some archival ROSA data. What we've done from that is we wanted to take a look at uh, how the four planets might behave under X-ray and EUV drift and evaporation um, from the current age of the system to solar age. And what we've done there is that we extrapolated the stellar high energy evolution along a variety of possible tracks, either past stellar spin down, so the star spins down at an early age, or um, comparing to some other stars where we know they have spun down quite late, um, and comparing these tracks and see what happens to the planets. And what we actually see, and this is the, the big plot there on the slide, is that depending on if we have a fast or a slow spin down, um, we can either have three planets falling below the um, radius gap, or we might actually just end up with one, the innermost, falling below the radius gap, why 
D and E actually remain above it. So um, we can have actually quite a big difference depending on what the star does and if the activity decays really early on or if we have a star that maintains its fast spin and high X-ray emission over quite a long time and then starts the spin down process. Yeah, and that's it. All right, thank you, Katya. Questions? So I have a quick one. By slow and fast spin down, are you? What is the host star of this system? Is it an M dwarf, where you see this big oh, dichotomy? This is actually a solar mass star. Okay, but don't those usually? I, I know there's a big dichotomy with spin down rates of low mass yeah. stars. Isn't that less pronounced for solar-like stars? So the dichotomy also exists for the solar mass stars. It just occurs earlier for the stars. So with the MGROS, we still see it basically nowadays with the old MGROS. Some have spun down, like we see in the work of uh, Elizabeth Newton, for example, and others are still rotating quite quickly. Um, for G stars, this happens much earlier in the star's life, but still there is quite a pronounced spread in rotation rates that we can see, for example, at 100 mega years or so. And depending on if this star will be one of those stars that stays a fast rotator for quite a while, or if it starts magnetically breaking relatively soon after this moment in time, um, that actually can make a pretty big difference on planets. Okay. Um, maybe one more quick question from Jamie. Which models are you using for fast versus slow spin down? Uh, so we are using um, a model by two et al from 2015. This is from the Manuel Güde group. Um, and they have a spin down model that is based on the observed spread of um, rotation periods for G dwarfs. Okay, thanks, Scott. Yeah, I think we should move on to our last talk, which is by Hilke Schlichting. Okay. So um, this is sort of going to be a hybrid between what we what we heard about in, I guess, session three today and session four. And so it's basically using um, polluted white dwarfs to basically dissect rocky material, maybe rocky planets, and use that to do some geochemistry. So what we did is we, there's a handful, actually um, 12 or so, white dwarfs for which you can measure, polluted white dwarfs, so for which you can measure all the major rock forming elements and plus oxygen and iron. And so what this allowed us to do is to do some geochemistry. Um, to of these rocks that are being accreted. And what specifically what this is called is oxygen fugacity. So oxygen fugacity um, that we calculated is just a measure of the oxidation state of the rocks. And so why do we care about this? It basically determines what minerals you can form, what sort of volcanism you would have, the likelihood of plate tectonics, um, and for example, how much water you could store um, in the mantle. So, um, we basically use those polluted white walls to calculate this quantity um, for, um, you know, sort of 12 or so systems. And um, the one minute upshot is that basically for a vast majority of the systems, which are as shown in these blue filled circles, um, that we find oxygen fugacities that are geochemically um, very similar um, to that of the value we find for Earth and Mars um, at several of the pieces in the asteroid belt. And that this value, so this is quite oxidized. Um, it's quite different from what you would predict um, for rocks just forming in the solar nebula, um, which is much more consistent with Mercury, which is shown in this yellow band over here. So to zero order, what's this telling us that um, whatever the rock forming process is, it's producing um, relatively oxidizing uh, or rel yeah, relatively uh, large oxygen fugacity, a relatively oxidizing material, similar to what we have for the Earth. Um, and that's different from what you naively predict for the solar gas. But whatever that process is, and actually we're not 100% sure how we do it, um, that seems to be ubiquitous. Um, and common. So I think it's a good, it's a good, uh, it's good news if you care about looking for life or looking for Earth-like planets, because I, you know, taking the talks from Diana and also Eric Eagle. So when you find something that is 
in density similar to Earth, it's probably okay to assume it has a similar iron content in um, the mantle as it has the Earth, meaning a similar oxygen for gasity. And also that if you would have outgassing in processes like this, you would get a similar geochemistry that we have for Earth, at least as a first guess. So let me stop here and we can talk about it more, but it's just a zero order <laughs> upshot. And you know, if you're interested in this, there's two papers down here that you can look up. One came out in science last year and there's one looking at many of these things in a lot more detail that came out um, just now. Great, thank you, Helka. Any questions? Hi, Helka, it's Dimitri. Yes, uh, I, what's, what's striking to me about this image is that uh, all of the data points, or most of them, seem to be consistent with Mars, but not Earth. Uh, I wonder yeah. if you can mm -hmm. actually distinguish uh, between those two. Yeah, so actually, I think you're, you're right about this. So you're gonna already going one step further. We were just like focusing on distinguishing something more like Earth-like <laughs> and Mercury, <laughs> but it's actually true. I actually 100% agree with you that um, now, this is actually the data from the New York paper, we have somewhat better measurements, we are often much more consistent with Mars than Earth, which is, I think, in itself interesting. Um, we haven't actually spent a lot of time looking at this distinction. We were sort of focused on just uh, getting the big difference. I should focus your attention on the x-axis. This is actually logarithmic. So we are very certain that we can distinguish the sort of rocky material from terrestrial planets like Earth and Mars from Mercury. But I agree with you, many of them look a lot more like Mars than Earth. So that's probably something else interesting to look into more. But yeah, I agree that it's true. I agree with that uh, conclusion. And I should right. also say these other things here are upper limits. So there are some that may be consistent with Mercury, but the vast majority for which we can really measure, make a measurement rather than just putting an upper limit, really look more like Mars, I agree. <laughs> so I should add this, <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, Hilke. I want to stop us there. I want to give us a couple of minutes here at the end. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Victor if he has any closing words in a second. But before that, I just want to stop and thank Victor Silva Aguirre for doing the dominant, playing the dominant role in organizing this conference. So let's everybody give Victor a big round of applause. Wow, a standing ovation. I hope that made it all worth it, Victor. <laughs> definitely, of course, it definitely does. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Anything you want to say to conclude the conference, Victor? I mean, just thank everyone for attending and participating, for the good discussions, the great talks, uh, all of them, and uh, yeah, for being part of it. And it's really nice to see all the work that came out of the program from last year. So I think I'm really happy with the outcome, and I hope people enjoyed it. Thank you for that. So everybody who wants to be in the group picture, please put your camera on. And I will go to the second page of, oh, so many people, this is great. And some more. And let's see, who else do we have? <laughs> I see more cats, this is great. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna take one more because sometimes some people just switched on their cameras and the final one there we are very good okay thanks everyone i will post the pictures tomorrow thanks. thank you and i think that was it thank thanks you everyone for thanks everyone this was great wonderful meeting. thank you everybody take care bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. everyone this was a lot of fun okay.